So now we will start the ASAI Symposium, uh, Lunch Symposium, and um, yeah, it's my great honor to um, introduce um, Gregor Leibungut, Professor Denz, and Professor Werner for this uh, symposium. Professor Werner is in his institution. He will give us his talk. Uh, we are, um, we are uh, Zoom online. And um, yeah, we are ready to go. The first part uh, will be a short introduction by Professor Werner. And um, I gave over to uh, Gerald. Yeah, hello, Kambis. So I hope you hear me well. Uh, sorry that we had to make a change of plan, but uh, because of the progress of the procedures and shortage of staff, so even the boss has to work a little bit at the weekend. Yeah, we can hear So, uh, these are my disclosures. Of course, this is uh, Asahi Symposium. Uh, Kambis already mentioned uh, our fellow panelists. Uh, Dr. Leibengut will talk about the uncrossable becomes crossable with the new guide wire technology. Uh, Kambis will talk about the microcatheter selection and manipulation. And then uh, Joe Denz will finish with the DLC masterclass beyond the basics. And then we have time for discussion and closing remarks. Uh, these are, I don't like to talk about algorithm. I like to talk about uh, skill sets that we have to use in the procedure. And um, unlike deciding whether you give uh, anticoagulation or not with AFib, I think uh, which way to go is also depending in a CTO, what is your favorite skill set? Are you uh, a re-entry guy? Are you an IVUS guided guy? Or do you prefer retrograde? But we need to conquer uh, to become perfect operators all parts of these skill sets. Of course, everything is based on the anti-grade approach. And we need appropriate tools to apply that. The bilateral access, it's, it sounds primitive, but if, like Cambys and myself, if we get referral angios often, we don't have a bilateral access applied in a CTO. The maximum backup of a guide catheter is the first decision to achieve success. We'll hear about the microcatheter and the wires. And of course, we have dedicated devices like the Stingray, micro balloons facilitating the passage of the occluded segment. Guide extensions became kind of an everyday tool, especially in the CTO setting. We need to have ablation devices, rotor plater, maybe the orbital atherectomy will also uh, be successful in Germany and uh, lithoplasty. We have to have good stents, IVUS, and as we discussed just in the case of uh, Masahisha Yamane, MSCT can be helpful to understand the lesion. It's still valid the old picture that I have published uh, in the EAPCI guidebook on coronary intervention. We have the proximal cap, the distal cap, the obstruction site, and we want to go straight through and the tool to get through straight through is the wires. And if you look at the wire technology development early on when I started CTO, it was largely Miracle and Conquest, and only in the mid 2005, 6, 7, we got XT and new wires. Talks about wires in the past were talking about sliding technique, drilling technique, penetration. Nowadays, I think we can use every wire, for everything. We can penetrate with a Gaia. Even with a fielder XT, we can penetrate. If we get through, we slide. It's how you manipulate the wire. And it took 16 years of development to get to the new generation. And as we already hear during the discussions of the cases with our Japanese operator friends, they have new technology that's not even available in Europe yet. In other parts of the world, yes. And that is actually my 
concern. So my first talk introduction is a little bit uh, a, a pessimistic approach because I think the revolution of CTO guide wires in Europe stopped with the introduction of the new medical device regulation. The last editions from modern CTO technology, especially Asahi, the leader and the think tank of CTO tool development was the Sasuke and the Gladius AX and MG. They were great additions to our tool set, but the Japanese operator, they work in a different mindset. And today, for example, you saw the ultimate uh, three replacement, Miracle Neo 3, wonderful displayed by Kenya Nasu in its ability to pass under control with a 14,000 inch wire. And of course, it's already six years ago when Itsu Tsushikane presented the, uh, the plasma wire, which is now taken over by Asahi uh, from uh, Osamu Kato's company who started the development. And we are looking forward, of course, to get to know about future developments. But again, I'm a little bit pessimistic that in Germany, it's now like the small guy on the right hand side and on the left hand side are the Japanese operators because the question in CTO PCI in Europe is not what tools we need, but what tools will become available and how many years we will fall behind Japan, Asia Pacific and US. And like right now I feel as a European a little bit like the young small guy there. Uh, and I hope that Azahi, as one of the leaders of new t tool technology development, will put all their efforts in the, in the MDR regulation process to get us these wires we are talking now about to our continent. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Gerald. Um... Yeah, uh, absolutely agree. And uh, even the US have uh, now more experience uh, with wire-based technologies uh, regarding the, uh, the development and the new uh, device regulation. So I, I have the same problem as you as well. And I, I, I can share your thoughts 100%. So um, yeah, we, we, we keep on uh, with the program. And I want to introduce uh, Gregor Leibengut uh, from uh, Basel. Uh, he's now at the University Heart Center, uh, University of Basel, uh, lead of the CAF lab, uh, so he changed position. And uh, he will talk about when the crossable becomes crossable, new guide wire technology. Thank you very much, Combis, for your kind introduction. Uh, just to switch the slides. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking about when the uncrossable becomes crossable. Uh, in general, this is a basic rule without wiring, no C to PCI. So there's a few techniques how to make the wire eventually cross at least the proximal cap and hopefully also later on the C to body can do a regular puncture and if your wire is too weak we use power puncture scratch and go we can use a balloon to deliberately dissect the vessel proximal to the cap and assist re-entry into the subintimal space uh, we can have a power knuckle increasing the backup of the microcatheter making the knuckle more powerful uh, you can add a dual loom microcatheter to support puncture or even a balloon with anchoring so-called side base, or you can hydraulically dissect the vessel with the Carlino technique. Now there's a second uncrossable lesion. Once the wire is through, it's so-called undilatable proximal cap or balloon uncrossable lesion. Um, therefore, we can progressively uh, inflate the balloon and do a balloon tracking or a BAM, um, balloon-assisted microdissection, basically just rupturing the proximal vessel. Um, and then trying to enter the subintimal space. Or we can have stiffer, uh, lower profile microcatheters to get more force and penetrate the proximal cap. We can have anti-grade proximal cap external crush to get into the subintimal space. In the US, they use laser. 
Um, once the wire is through, you can also apply a rotational arthrectomy, hydraulic dissection again, or you come from the retrograde. And if you come from the retrograde, you face a little bit softer plaque, which is usually easier to overcome, but still we have basically the same means, except for heavy duty catheters that would not be safe to cross a retrograde route, septal or even an epicardial. So some limitations here. But yes, yeah, you could see that most uh, uh, techniques, you, you eventually end up in the subintimal space. And then it's all about wiring in that outer space or um, doing the di dissection re-entry techniques. This is um, newer techniques. Also, we have new devices and we have much more possibility to get around so-called uncrossable or undilatable proximal caps and lesions. The concept is easy. We're traveling within that intimal space in the tunica media uh, between the tunica intima and the externa. And this is basically how I imagine traveling the subintimal space. Uh, you have some device that you're going within the vessel wall and you try not to exit outside because that's uh, deleterious, but you also cannot get inside into that uh, tube. You can do that both ways, integrate, then it's called integrate dissection reentry or retrograde, the retrograde dissection reentry technique. And uh, integrately, we used to do it with the boss and uh, stingray to re-enter. Boss is a catheter that has a blunt tip um, and also a high tip load. And then you just start spinning it and bluntly dissect. However, there's a limitation. You can only do that safely in an integrate fashion. But now we have a new technique, which is also dissecting the vessel bluntly. It's wire-based and we call it knuckling. Basically, knuckle technique is used to create, as I said, a deliberate blunt dissection and to travel within the subintimal space. And we usually use polymer jacketed wires that form a loop and then are advanced anti When should we knuckle? As I said, in ADR, whenever the wire escalation strategy, parallel wiring failed, in tortuous anatomy, ambiguous vessel course, if there are no side branches, it's more ideal and if there is no distal bifurcation um, with a good landing zone knuckling is a good technique and retrogradely of course uh, do modified reverse car technique and it's also safer to knuckle retrograde because the re-entry is easier in an anti-grade guide than going anti-gradely. To know a little bit about knuckling and why it works technically we need to know about tip load Tip load in general is a function of the core thickness and sturdiness and the more robust your core is, the higher your tip load is. You also know that guide wires have different tips from rounded, pointed, tapered, up to pointed and tapered. And as you can imagine, the eventual penetration power is then a function of that uh, tip load divided by the tip area. And when you have different tip loads and different tip areas and you match those, you can imagine how many different types of wires with different behaviors you can actually achieve. An analogy of that is um, when you have high heels, so the tip load would be the weight of the person wearing them and the area, either the toe or the tip, is basically the tip of your wire. And you can imagine when you step on your toes with the tip, uh, with the, on your foot with the toes, with the large area, then it's less painful and less penetrable than when you get hit with the heel. And the heel would be the penetration wire, the knuckle wire is the toe, is the tip, sorry. So tip load versus penetration power, and it really improves the safety of this wire. When you have a high tip load in a non-polymeric, it would just penetrate like the green wire here, and you had perforation eventually. And whenever you have a high tip load, but also a high tip area and the wire is polymeric and very slippery, you can actually follow within the architecture of the vessel and safely reach distality. So some famous people told me, Greg, trust the knuckle. This is what I give my fellows and I really still trust the knuckle very much. So just to show you the specialty guide wires, if you, um, if you name them a 
thing to coating, we have the polymer jacketed wires and there you have soft, intermediate and hard tapered tip wires and in the meantime there's several manufacturers and names available and they're in general all suitable for knuckling. However, some are more and some are less suitable when you have a very thin taper tip polymer jacketed wire such as the Fielder XTA, your knuckle is, tends to be weaker and um, tends to go, grow bigger. Whenever you have a more powerful knuckle, it can start knuckling much earlier with um, less looping of the tip of the wire. These are some types of knuckles that I find in my CTO PCIs. Tiny with a Fielder XDA, very weak, then small with the Gladius MG, very powerful and still small. And then larger knuckles would be do done by Pilot 200, Gladius EX, tip load 4.2 gram but um, not at the dedicated knuckle wire, so they can end up in large knuckles in heavy calcified lesions. And this is how these Gladius EX look like on my bench after knuckling, because you're actually deforming the core, they all stay deformed and you cannot maneuver them back into a catheter or do a tip-in, uh, for example. However, now the Gladius MG is available. It's basically a Gladius EX, which has a micro-shaped uh, tip, uh, um, as well, but the special feature is that after eight millimeters behind the tip, there's a, a specific knuckle point. And this is called micro gap. And as you can see in yellow, this is the tip load of the Gladius MG according to distance from the tip. And you can st see a steep, go, um, a steep increase at about eight millimeter uh, caused by the micro gap. And it actually makes the wire fold exactly at that spot have a very high penetration, uh, high tip load, low penetration power because of the big area of the of the bend of the knuckle, but still enough power to disrupt the intima and go anti And in blue, there is a Pilot 200 or also Gladius EX, and you can see to have the same force of the knuckle indicated in that red dot, you need to have a loop of your knuckle of almost three millimeter, uh, three centimeter and that can be a problem in some cases. Here you can see the Pilot 200 Gladys EX on the top, and as soon as the knuckle folds, it just gets to, uh, it's getting bigger and bigger until you have the force at that knuckle point to overcome the resistance. And when you look at the lower um, image, you can see the Gladius MG also forms a knuckle, but then because you already have that high um, penetration power or tip load at the knuckle point, can actually advance the knuckle, which is well controlled, doesn't create big subintimal hematoma, and also has some nice tip reshapability or refolding after you pass the, to the distality. Now you knuckle through your distal um, until your distal vessel. But now the question is how to get back into the lumen, and there is some uh, different techniques um, described. I just want to go over them really briefly. So this is basically your situation that you're at. You manage to go uh, around the CTO body and are luring at the distal uh, entry point. You can do a star, which is just close your eyes and advance the wire and hope that it's somewhere I enters into the vessel. Problem is that it usually enters late and also cuts off all the side branches. And this is what keeps our CTOs open. If you have good outflow, you have a good outcome. And if you cut off all the side branches, your outflow is most likely uh, impaired. Last is an optimized star. It just means that your re-entry zone is limited behind the distal cap. I think it's still somehow by chance. If you enter early, it's a last. If you enter late, you start it. AFR is anti-grade fenestration re-entry. You use a parallel balloon to your spintoma wire and you disrupt the distal plaque um, and you have some kind of re-entry into the created re-entry into the lumen. You can also do that base um, device based with stingray and you just puncture back into the vessel. New methods are applied with the recross, also aligning a little bit to the vessel and then you can use the second lumen to puncture back into the vessel. Subintima hematoma is your biggest enemy in this situation because it compresses your distal landing zone. Therefore, you can stick either a microcatheter or a stingray balloon inside and aspirate the blood out from the hematoma. And once it collapses, you then re-enter into the lumen. 
The safest re-entry is in retrograde fashion, so-called reverse card, basically knuckling up with your retrograde wire. Then you inflate an anti-grade balloon, make some space, and you just wait until the balloon deflates and releases some of the space available for the retrograde wire. Then you enter the wire and exit. And now you can have a target to enter, which is the anti-grade guide extension catheter, which makes it much easier and more successful. What can go wrong when you do knuckling? Mostly on your re-entry. Um, but you should never spin knuckled wires because they create knots and you cannot retrieve them back into your microcatheter, especially through in retrograde knuckling. They tend to go inside branches, so be careful that you still a little bit know about where the wire should go in your anatomy. Big knuckles can weaken or rupture eventually when you implant the stent. Small knuckles, they can distal perforation, cause distal perforations if they're really small. Um, and you should never knuckle without a non-polymeric wire because they tend to get stuck and twist and bend and then you get stuck in the microcatheter again. So if you manage to do the re-entry, it's really hot and uh, you have managed to, uh, to overcome the unpenetrable or the uncrossable lesion. And uh, with that, I want to leave you. Thank you very much. So we will take the questions at the end. Uh, so the next speaker is uh, Kams Mashayeki. He will discuss with us microcatheter selection and manipulation for specific lesions. Kamis. Thank you very much. Uh, by the way, Gregor, um, the, the, all the drawings you did, you did by your own, right? So uh, we have to respect a lot. Uh, I mean, it's a lot of work and uh, uh, beautiful images. And uh, like a graphic designer, you can build a second career. So the microcatheter selection and manipulation, how to make the right choice. Thanks, Joe. So um, I will focus on the microcatheter series from Asai Intec. It is, it is an industry-sponsored uh, uh, symposium here. And, uh, and um, well, the whole story started in 2011 with the Corsair. And the implementation of the Corsair in Europe uh, was uh, um, essential for the retrograde approach. And uh, there were the first publication out of uh, Rivers Cart and uh, in Cart in 2006, and then Rivers Cart, a concept. And <clears throat> this was there were two papers out, I think, in Jack Intervention 2011, if I remember right, where the microcatheter Corsair was uh, introduced as well as the Rivers Cart uh, maneuver. So, <clears throat> 2016, the Caravel came up and uh, it was a very useful device, especially for thinner epicardial channels. But as well, the microcatheter is very useful for, let's say, more simpler, uh, uh, also anti-grade procedures uh, because of its great profile, also for uh, regular uh, complex uh, PCI scenarios where you might need also uh, a, a microcatheter for exchange uh, for rotor wire, so it can be very useful. In 2017, there was a new evolution of the new Crossair Pro, so they made the device even better from the tip uh, to the um, also the torque transmission and um, and um, well. Um, so and now we have already the Crossair Pro XS, and I will focus a little bit on the different. Uh, uh, microcatheters. I think the Crossair Pro is the standard microcatheter. You can use it for complex PCI for the anti-grade crossing and also still a very good device for me um, for septal crossing. The fact that um, it, it's, it's a channel dilator but it gives you a little bit more backup when you need, um, uh, let's say, when you have a very difficult CTO with calcification and you might end up in retrograde knuckle wire. I think the Corsair is one of the most supportive devices you can have for that. Um, well, the Caravel, I had uh, the chance to, uh, that, that uh, the, um, the designer of the Caravel here is uh, his name, uh, um, visit my center uh, when, we, when, when, when the Caravel was introduced. It's, uh, I mean, for me, it was a very good add-on because at this time, <clears throat> for retrograde passages, especially epicardial ones, 
Well, we had the fine cross, which is still working, uh, but it, it, had, it did not have a tapered tip. So we never had access to the fine cross GP in Europe. I tried it multiple times to get the device, but uh, the regulation did not allow it. So, and um, at this time we had also the opportunity for the Turnpike LP, which was already out in 2016 as well. Um, even a little bit earlier, and um, then as I came with the Carwell, uh, which is probably at the moment the safest microcatheter regarding retrograde passage of tiny epicardial collaterals. Well, saying that, you see, you uh, have your microcatheters, and um, you will be very comfortable with Cosia Pro for integrated approach, septal retrograde approach, complex calcified scenarios, as well as the Carwell for um, uh, with the low profile and also very flexible trackability device. And, um, but nevertheless, I mean, there are many, many centers out there uh, where they can only have one microcatheter and uh, uh, because of uh, institutional regulatory. And uh, maybe there is, maybe this would be a good alternative if you have to choose one, because you do, can do uh, a lot with this Cross Air Pro XS. Uh, saying that it's a good device for integrated approach as well for um, um, retrograde uh, approach as well. Great passability, great trackability and trackability. Um, maybe a little bit uh, too uh, big even for the very small epicardial connection, but almost the non so expert operators are um, not tackling those kind of uh, connections. So therefore I think it uh, for an operator is doing septal and integrate and, and and not touching too complex epicardial connections. I think this would be a good uh, a good opportunity if you have only to choose one device. So here are the specifics of this new Corsair Pro XS. The entry profile is 1.3 uh, French, and the distal shaft is 2.7. And uh, you see there is a strong backup support from the proximal shaft of 2.9 French. So one thing that um, you, the concept that we have to understand a little bit that there are different um, shaft orientations for the microcatheters. So um, it's, it's like um, left-winded or right-winded. The left-winded, it's on the right side here, left-winded, it's um, S orientation and the right-winded is a set orientation. So uh, why is this of importance? So if you have an S shaft, let's say, um, and uh, you are torquing towards clockwise direction, you have a higher torque because the microcatheter is thinner and tightened. If you have a clockwise uh, rotation, the microcatheter is getting thicker and losing. And vice versa in the set shaft. The set shaft, when you return clockwise, it's getting bigger. And when you return counterclockwise, it's getting thin, thinner. And this we know from the uh, Crosshair as well, right? So, um, and, and here you see the clockwise rotation of the microcatheter with the, sorry, with the S shaft. Uh, so when you rotate the microcatheter clockwise, that uh, it tightens the shaft. So why is this of importance? And also vice versa, when you rotate the microcatheter cl the clockwise, it's losing the shaft, but get more expansion. So this is of importance, especially when the microcatheter gets sucked. Normally you do a counterclockwise rotation, you enter the septal, and on a, on, on a certain point you might feel resistance. So, um, and you should not over the rotate, especially when the tip is fixed. But if you then secondly rotate the clockwise direction, what is happening is the microcatheter is getting thicker and it is enlarging the septal channel and uh, therefore you have a bigger septal channel and this can help you like a small balloon inflation and therefore in resistance when you have a resistance passing the septal it's important also to understand the concept making the microcatheter thinner on counterclockwise rotation and making the microcatheter a little bit thicker and tighter once you do a clockwise rotation Afterwards, coming back to a counterclockwise rotation. I hope it was not so complicated. But another important thing is, as you can see here, is the transmission force and the transmission time. So you rotate and then also you give a little bit on pressure and you wait until your rotation 
is transported to the tip, as you can see here. So I really wait long. I also use a little bit passive backup of the Ortic Bulbus, and this was not so easy to pass this channel, but you see the Corsair clockwise, uh, counterclockwise rotation, then push, and the device cams. It takes a little bit on time. Here I give push, 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 also with the passive backup of the guide, and this is how we could pass the channel. <clears throat> it's also important to understand that the rotation push is uh, um, with the new uh, Corsair Pro has a much more higher penetration force and um, rotation resistance reduction. So where you have to be careful is in these scenarios. Let's say calcification, the wire get 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 stuck, and uh, you have to torch it in calcification. You somehow try to overcome this in um, um, with with a lot of rotation. So um, doing these procedures uh, every day or many years, you have a much more force on rotating and transmission force than an operator who never did that. So once you fix your torquer, uh, you can, uh, uh, once you're very routine, you have so much transmission force actually in your hand that you are able even to um, uh, um, yeah, destroy the tip. And this is uh, especially in retrograde a problem because when the tip gets fixed in calcium and you feel that your confidence are pro like here, uh, is uh, uh, losing the resistance, uh, so it has more resistance when you uh, are going with the wire and try to manipulate the wire. At this point, and you feel that the manipulation of the wire is getting more difficult, this is exactly the point where you have to stop to rotate, uh, which means at this point you have to disengage the microcatheter and take a new one because the tip will be, um, let's say, destroyed almost by the calcified plaque. So here you can see because it's not, it's not funny to retrieve this microcatheter, especially when you passed from uh, epicardial side with the stiff CP12 uh, and you have to retrieve everything like I had to do here. So please take this in mind. The wire has always to be free and do not over rotate these devices, especially when the tip is fixed. So here is an um, epicardial connection. I remember the case was done in Krakow several years ago. Um, the LED was occluded, the Lima craft was occluded, and the RCA was occluded, uh, and uh, yeah, I think so. Well, and um, so somehow I failed the antiquated approach, and this is the channel which I had to track. Um, at this time, I think I, there was only the fine cross available and the Corsair. Uh, but I uh, want to show you the manipulation of the Corsair. So uh, Sion Black was already uh, there, and there is the Sion Black and the Corsair in the epicardial collateral connection. One very important thing is what you have to understand passing these channels is also uh, bends. And uh, bends, um, like yesterday, like you have seen, these kind of bends are very, very dangerous, especially in epicardial connections. You have seen that yesterday during my case, if, uh, um, and uh, that uh, these kind of bands, when you advance the microcatheter, might prolapse. Because especially when you have a, a soft, very soft wire, uh, suicide free. So the wire almost never can destroy a channel, but in combination with the microcatheter tip, it can destroy the channel, but it's more the microcatheter because uh, but the, the Sion Black behaves a little bit different. So the Sion Black even gives you more support towards the tip on the radiopaque part. So, but this is a, a thing here, uh, a loop, where you have several things in mind. First of all, you get more resistance on your wire tip there. You cannot control your wire anymore, so you have to try to overcome this, this uh, bend. And you know, and this is actually the, the difference at which point you have to advance your microcatheter, at which point you uh, may have uh, 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 normally, um, the goal is always to pass the channel without advancing the microcatheter. So my goal is always just to pass the channel with the wire. And once the wire is in the distal vessel, past the collateral, then with the shaft of the wire, the non radio pack, I have a good, uh, 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 clear pathway where the microcatheter can follow. But here, if you are, have, have several tutorcities, on a certain point and you need a more wire control for passing the channel, you have to advance the microcatheter. And that's exactly what is happening here, is that already the, the loop with the microcatheter prolapsed in the side branch. And I'm quite sure that this, if, uh, this may cause uh, epicardial perforation as well. So at this point, 
uh, sorry, what I did here, after rotating the microcatheter, I, I rotate to the counterclockwise and then to the clockwise direction. Uh, doing that, I had a better dilatation of the channel at this time, and then I could overcome the, M the, 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 the strange bend of the channel there, and um, then the wire was again more free to, uh, to pass the collateral. So sometimes when you get in the, when, you know, when the microcatheter is getting longer and the tip is, uh, the micro is pushing the tip towards, uh, uh, with the bend, and you might have a prolapse of the, of the wire tip, and go back again and try to thicken the channel a little bit up with clockwise rotation, and sometimes uh, you might be successful. At this time, already the concept was clear to me uh, about the device and how to use the device. So, well, uh, the rest was, was, was no problem. Um, well, now with the newer microcatheter uh, technologies, I've, I've, I've shown this because it's such a beautiful case for the sewer zero free. It was uh, done in, in, in Riga, this case, with uh, uh, Iker, and um, I remember very well because it was fantastic uh, to help this patient with uh, LED occlusion post cabbage. And this is this. Just look at this. I mean, you don't have to say anything. You just watch. And this is the fantastic specificity of the suo zero free uh, that it still uh, is able to, after you have a small loop, not very small, but loops like that, that you still can have via control. It's very athermatic. And uh, the shaft is quite, uh, um, uh, quite uh, supportive but not the tip. But this, uh, these things can be done now with this new uh, wire technology. Um, here a little bit another example as well, uh, also combination of sewer zero free with the, um, um, with the caravel. Uh, so it was with uh, Mohamed Ayub in Bad Krozingen. And here you see uh, the, the sewer zero free these three, four loops, what is taking and still there is a certain wire control pass the channel in a dramatic way, and then the microcatheter could follow easily. For sure, you can push this to the extreme uh, um, scenarios, like here in a patient with a very, very severe renal impairment, where I did a kissing wire technique to save contrast as well, went over this collateral connection, kissing wire, and then a puncture down. So those kind of things, this channel was not destroyed, uh, is able with a combination of sewer zero free and uh, and 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 um, um, a carowell. Um, so uh, yeah. So I think summarizing that um, we have different microcatheters uh, for um, for CTO PCI uh, from the uh, SI company. Uh, still, I, I I have all of them for sure. But uh, the Corsair Pro and the Caravel are very useful in combination. But uh, as you see, the Crosshair Pro X, if you are only allowed to take probably one product, it's a good choice for your cath, cath lab. Um, I think, uh, yeah, saying that, I'm, I'm, I'm finished with my, uh, with my talk. Thank you very much. Robert, go ahead. Oh, yes, I have a question. A great presentation. I think the tip of clockwising and counterclockwising to avoid the prolapse is a great tip. Uh, I will try next. But I saw that that one was, was a Corsair. Yeah. So is this the same with the Caravel? Because often I use Caravel to go in the Picardo. No, not really. No, no. The, the, normally, the, so what we are doing, well, which what was never, never, let's say it's never recommended from the company that you rotate the Caravel. The reason is, uh, the torque transmission towards the tip in the car well is like, I don't know, uh, six or eight or even ten times more. So you need only two or one or two rotation to have a complete rotation of the whole tip. Mm -hmm. This is different uh, with the Corsair. Here you rotate six, seven, eight times and the tip is rotating slowly because there's transmission. It's a different uh, uh, construction. So therefore, Whenever the carvel tip, and this I had to learn, um, unfortunately, during life case as well, when the carvel gets stuck with the tip and you rotate it, you're able to disconnect the tip. Ah. So in epicardials, it's a little bit different. In epicardials, sometimes um, only the push 
um, doesn't feel us so comfortable in these tortuosities. And I think with a rotational push, we can control the tip a little bit better. So some tiny rotations in epicardial, when you have resistance, might be useful with the car wheel as well. I've seen it, uh, all the operators, and uh, Yamane, I watch them, and, and, and they are all doing that as well, and they know this construction as well. Um, I don't know what the official statement of the company is, but this is what I can tell you from my experience at least. And the excess is in the similar like, uh, similar like, uh, like, like the Corsair. So if, if you, just one quick comment, if you would take only one microcatheter in your cat lab and it would be Corsair excess, of course you have to decide on the length. So if you would do retrograde procedures, it would be a long Corsair excess. And there's one disadvantage then, of course, that you uh, lose a bit of uh, pushability uh, on the device. So it, it will be less strong to penetrate actually a difficult cap. And now, anyhow, we are in discussion now. So I have an important question, I think, for the, our first speaker, that is, uh, what about knuckle redirection? So uh, please give us a tip and trick on that, because it's an important message for the audience. Okay. Um, well, knuckle redirection is only possible if you have an intact tip, I would say. And this is usually not the case in all the knuckle that we've done previously with Pilot 200 probably most of the time and I knock a lot of times with Gladys EX and Fielder of course, Fielder XTA. But as I showed on one slide, eventually you have to push them that far to overcome that resistance that you end up having the knuckle very way back from the tip. And as you all know, I mean, these are all core to tip wires. So meaning the core goes from from the core itself almost or exactly to the tip. So as soon as that knuckle or that wire starts to bend, you will have a bend that is not resolvable and it doesn't release when you want to refold or unfold and get into a catheter. Whereas with the Gladys MG, this really nicely uh, performs almost always unless you push it beyond that micro gap and you are actually starting knuckling within the core, then the same thing will happen you will have a bigger secondary bend, which makes it difficult to, to, to maneuver. But if you stay with the, the dedicated knuckle, you can get into the anti break guide. That's how I usually do it. Retract it, and it will unfold, and the wire is straight like it came out of the box. And then you can enter an anti micro microcatheter. really works. So s sometimes, uh, probably also, um, you have to also sometimes penetrate tissue, right, to redirect. Sometimes it's not, so my experience, not always possible to redirect the knuckle wire itself, right? Um, um, yeah. Especially if you have a really a completely, I mean, if the whole vessel is absolutely calcified on a certain point and the knuckle wires are going somewhere so in that which tissue or pericardium, <laughs> uh, especially post cabbage, and sometimes you have to puncture again with stiff wire uh, to overcome resistance and then knuckle again, right? Yep. Yes, my, generally I think Unless with the Gladys MG, knuckling is not something you can direct. It just goes the path of least resistance. And as soon as you also have secondary bend within the core of the wire, it gets unmaneuverable. You can try to follow with the micro close to the tip. But let's say in a Gladius EX, if the, the core is bent, it starts bending your microcatheter. It makes it completely un uncontrollable. So, yeah, what I do sometimes is that uh, I just bring back my device or the microcatheter and use another, uh, another uh, wire. So, if, for example, if the first one was the Fielder XTR, then probably switch to a Gladius because the, the shape of the knuckle can be different, especially when you have a new dissection plane. So, you try to get into a new dissection plane to get, for example, beyond the bifurcation. So, when the knuckle always went into the bifurcation. So, this helps. And the other thing, of course, is once your knuckle is a bit more distal and you know, and that is what can be said, if you are at the bifurcation, you bring in your microcatheter just at the bifurcation, then you pull the knuckle back and you redirect with another wire. It's a bit less safe. The other technique, I think, just look for another dissection plane uh, also can help you. And uh, in, in case of bifurcation, you can also uh, just uh, balloon in uh, of close to close like a side base as well, yes, right? Which is sure. very, very helpful. Yeah. Uh, in scenarios as well to redirect the wire. I mean, 
there might be even parallel knuckling, which is not described, I, I think, but this is what I have yeah, done just, already. So yeah. you just leave your first knuckle because it's getting too big, it's outside. You don't want to move it because you're still disrupting tissue, creating subintimal hematoma growth. So you just go with the parallel knuckle. And as can be said, then you have maybe you overcome the next few millimeters you have to puncture, and then you go back to knuckling. So it's also incorporated in wire escalation, de escalation. Absolutely. So you can use a double lumen microcatheter in that yeah. scenario. <laughs> Which is your topic now, uh, Joe. Go on. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So it's about uh, double lumen microcatheters. I think the Sasuke has some specific features. That is its length. Uh, the exit port is very short to the tip, so 6.5 millimeters. There's a specific coating increasing lubricity. It has a double stainless steel core. It oval design, visible exit, and a soft tapered tip. So, um, I think we all know now that double lumen microcatheters in CTO have a real place. Um, they can be used in an anti-grade fashion and a retrograde fashion. One of them uh, was discussed a couple of times during the meeting, so that's intraplug anti-grade wiring as an alternative for parallel wiring. Once you are extra plug, so distal from the CTO body, you might use it uh, for re-entry with or without IVIS guidance. And, of course, if your proximal cap is at the bifurcation, there's that possibility of a side branch anchor. If your distal cap is at the bifurcation, you need to pick up a side branch, a case we saw today, too. And retrograde, it can be used for collateral crossing. Sometimes the collaterals start in a retroflex fashion, or we need to redirect our wire. Retrograde distal cap penetration is uh, especially an issue when you arrive at the crooks and the cap is really at that bifurcation. And then wiring the distal vessel over an external, externalized wire is also an option. So just let's go to quick through a couple of cases. So this thing we often uh, encounter, so the side branches at the proximal cap. Now, actually, there are three techniques. So the workhorse wire can be pushed into this, this open side branch. Then your dual lumen side port is used for your second wire, proximal from the CTO. And this will be then a low penetration force wire. The only aim in this position is that the double lumen wire, a uh, double lumen microcatheter will increase your support and a bit the orientation of your wire away from the side branch. Second technique is a workhorse wire in an open side branch. You will bring in your dual lumen exit port just in front of the CTO and you will puncture with your second wire. So here you can use low, intermediate or high penetration force wires as long as your exit port is in front of this uh, cap. And then the third scenario is I think the, the best one to do is the workhorse wire is in the open side branch. You deliver your dual lumen into the side branch together with your stiff wire, but it's safe at that point. Then you pull back your double lumen wire, and then you can bring in, redirect your stiff wire from the side branch into the cap. Just a case example of uh, scenario one, a large uh, side branch here, two infralateral branches from the circ. Uh, so we could wire the, the first infralateral branch, but of course this is a bifurcation and we needed to pick up the second branch, and the second branch was just picked up uh, uh, from the dual lumen catheter being in front of the CTO cap. So this is a less used scenario, but uh, a possible scenario. So the other thing is, suppose your cap, your, is the distal cap is at the bifurcation and you need up a side branch. So what will you do? So just by case example, so we have a quite long CTO of the right coronary artery, with the ending up at the bifurcation with a big post for lateral branch, branch and a, a nice posterior descending artery. So we started up with a single lumen microcatheter. We went with Confianza Pro 12, went to the posterior descending artery, true to true wiring. And then um, we, we just create some space with a 2.0 balloon, not too big, not to have too much uh, shift actually, 2.0 balloon. Then bring in the double lumen microcatheter. So in this case, uh, Sasuke was brought in into the posterior descending artery together with the fielder wire. Then you pull back, and you can see here the position of Sasuke. Sasuke is pulled back, and now our wire is pulled back and just enters very smoothly this uh, posterolateral branch. So maybe I'll let it run again. 
So the Suzuki now is in front of the bifurcation, the feeler is pulled back and it just crosses into uh, the posterior lateral branch and this is the final result. So this is just proximal and distal cap anti greatly. You can also use double lumen microcatheters in dissection techniques. So this is a very complex CTO with a blunt cap, just a side branch there. Um, there's a lot of calcium in this vessel and in the distal target there is an old open stent. Uh, but there is a bit of landing zone just in front of the stent. You can actually see moving the calcium together uh, with the vessel architecture. So what we did is just have a, from one port, and this is uh, not a Sasuke, this is an, um, a recross uh, device. So we just had the soft wire into the side branch. And then we first puncture from the side port. Uh, you can see it follows a bit the calcium, but it's clearly out. I mean, it's not into the true lumen with the Gaia 3 from the side. Then you keep your microcatheter in place. You try to pick up uh, this exit port with an XTR, or it could be a fight or whatever. But you just knuckle your um, XTR from the side port. And of course, then you need to trap your double lumen catheter out and re-advances because the tip of the microcatheter has to, be, has to follow your knuckle wire. You can also see already that your knuckle is just beyond your target or landing zone. So now the recross is exactly in place. I hope it's not too small to see it on, on the screen, but you actually can nicely see that the Confianza Pro X exits in the right direction of the, of the vessel. Um, and uh, you can see that the Confianza Pro 12 actually follows the vessel and gets into this old stand, crosses this stand. And this is a scenario again for trapping out, bringing a single lumen microcatheter and finish the procedures with a couple of stents. So the other thing is um, now retrograde. So when will we use it? When you have a hairpin or reverse wiring technique needed. Uh, for those who are not familiar with you, so you have to make two bands on your wire, so distally as you conventionally do. And then the second one is that you just kink over the wire, and this can be two or three centimeters uh, from, from the tip of the wire. And then you just load it like this. You have the, the kink in the wire just positioned at your exit port and you push the device like that down into your um, hub actually and your guiding catheter. Okay, so let's uh, just an example because it's a nice example. It's not a septal but a diagonal. So you will see here advancement of the Suzuki together with the hairpin wire. So the Suzuki needs to be brought distal from the bifurcation and this is why you sometimes need to make it a bit shorter. Have a look at it. So the Suzuki goes. Now you have to remove the Sasuke. Uh, I mean, you have to bring the Sasuke more proximal position and you just pull on the wire and it goes into this, uh, in this case, the diagonal branch. Of course, the direction of this wire is not 100% right. So we did an exchange for a single lumen microcatheter to have our wire in the best position. But it uh, again shows the, the technique and the final result uh, after crush stenting. Good. There's still an option for uh, in retrograde procedures to use a double lumen microcatheter in more difficult uh, collaterals. So this is a CTO of the right. It's blunt. Um, you have uh, the distal target is, uh, is bad. There's a, a large PD there. But um, okay, there was a very nice septal connection, a bit weird. Uh, so you have the septal connection, which is not straight, which bends away and then have, have that shower of uh, multiple septal connections. And what sometimes happens then is that your wire goes into the wrong uh, and you do not get access to the distal one. Maybe with redirection, re manipulation, other bands and other things, you can redirect it in a more proximal connection. But what we did is just bring in the Sasuke over this first placed wire, bring in the Suo uh, tree, and the Suo tree immediately went into the, the target we wanted to. So as you can see here, it's confirmed on the Anjo. I hope it's big enough. So the tip of the sewer is just in this nice subtle collateral connection. So and on the right hand side, you can see that, okay, after a little bit of extra beats at the apex, but this is uh, often when you have the uh, last movement into the artery, you can see some extra beats and then it gets in and you can finish the procedure uh, with reverse cards. Okay, so that's for that. Now, you can also use it when a uh, you need a retrograde pathway and the distal cap is blunt at the bifurcation. And this is typical for the right. 
So this is the CTO of the right, but you can appreciate already that this CTO is or probably will be at the crux. It's, you're always happy when there is a small channel there. Uh, I think Campus could agree on that. So what you do first is uh, we needed in this uh, particular patient a super cross. It could also have been a hairpin wiring um, or a venture uh, catheter, but okay. The Cardafel follows the Sion Black after this. You can do a tip injection now at the crooks and unfortunately there's no real pathway uh, into the direction of the distal right. So what you can do now is exchange again for a Sasuke and then of course the Sasuke will be the, the uh, distal tip of the Sasuke will be on the soft wire which is in the posterior lateral branch. So your exit port now is for the stiff wire which will enter the distal cap here and Gladius was used. But what you can do, because this not always works, because the direction might be a bit uh, difficult at that. So what you can do, leave your wire there, trap out the Sasuke, uh, but you leave the stiff wire in. So the stiff wire from the exit port, you leave it in there at that spot, you trap the Sasuke out and bring the Sasuke back in. Uh, and now the Sasuke, the distal exit of the Sasuke will be from the more stiffer wire. And now you can use the side port for uh, support of your Sasuke. I've done that before. There's a folder from Asai where it's uh, described this technique. Okay, and after this, it was, we were able to puncture the cap and uh, finish the procedure. And this is the last one. So sometimes when you come retrograde, and especially when you come from right to left, uh, you, you are already happy that you can cross uh, a septal connection, but it might be that you end up very close to the, dis uh, to the distal CTO cap. So this is an LED occlusion with some uh, collaterals filling from septal. So we first did anti-grade wiring and unfortunately it uh, failed. So this is a situation where I'm not so happy when anti-grade wiring fails, but uh, of okay. then we have to go for a retrograde approach in this uh, particular patient. And so we had now a retrograde uh, cyan black, which goes to the distal LED, as you can see here. So it nicely follows the distal LED. But the septal connection is very close to the distal CTO cap. So we could bring in uh, the caravel up to the uh, distal cap. And the gladius will cross and can be, we could do an externalization. So now you have to pick up the distal LED. And the problem in this patient was that the caravel uh, did not cross that easily. We had to modify this uh, CTO body, and what happens then, you do a plug shift towards your true lumen, you, you destroy actually your access to the distal vessel. So in that scenario, just bring in again a double lumen microcatheter over your externalized wire. So your double lumen microcatheter always, always will be in the correct position. And then from the exit port, you can use any wire. We first used fielder, but it failed, and then we went for Pladius and it went in, and so we could finish the procedure. So these are a bit the different scenarios where uh, I can advise to use the double lumen catheters. So they are a valuable tool in treatment of complex CTOs. First of all, and this is the most easy scenario to enter the proximal cap when it's at the bifurcation. The second scenario, important scenario, is to pick up an important side branch at the distal cap. Then to redirect wires and eventually knuckles, as we discussed already to puncture a distal cap uh, at the bifurcation from retro. So this is also important when the uh, CTO is at the crooks, for example, to wire anti-greatly the distal vessel in the direction of a retro marker. I didn't show the example because of the time. And to wire anti-grade the distal vessel over an externalized wire. And I think for retrograde procedures, the Sasuke is the longest microcatheter available and just have a look at the paper on dual lumen microcatheters from Pixaras in your intervention. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much for this excellent overview. It looks like there is every week there's another technique you can do with the dual lumen microcatheters. You soon need a second slide for that. Um, one thing that we saw with CombiStalk is that we have very high torqueability and force transmission with our uh, single lumen microcatheters. This is a little bit missing with the Sasuke. Um, you showed very nicely cases where you go even retrograde transeptal, where I assume that there might be um, issues with uh, force transmission. Do you think there is a place for a braided 
will loom microcatheter or we don't need it? What is your experience? Okay, <laughs> I think, um, yeah, we don't need that often, that dual lumen, lumen microcatheter. So what you also can do is, once it is in, in place, you, you always can fall back first on your single lumen microcatheter and then use an uh, extra support wire. So that would be my first step. Just exchange it again for a single mic, then an extra support wire, which is in the, in the, at the target vessel, and then try to bring in uh, again the double lumen microcatheter. That's what I, how I would try to solve this problem now. Do we need braided? Well, um, yeah, everything that increased, every technology that adds possibilities is, is good. So um, the, the biggest problem with CTOs is that it's still too complex, it still takes too long. Uh, that, that's for me the major issue. So all technologies that increase the speed with which we can finish the procedure would be, would be nice to have. That's just a general comment. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Joe.